so cool. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Bill, alcoholic. Uh, yeah. uh, my sobriety date is June 15th, uh, 2013, so coming up on 10 years. Um, <clears throat> I have, this is my second time around. Um, and so I've had two very different experiences in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so I benefit from the contrasting values of them. Um, I was, um, so I was a mess long before I came to AA. I was born into some horrific abuse uh, that I was fortunate enough to survive. Um, and uh, so I, was, I took my first drink when I was 10 and it was, it was awesome. Uh, it was amazing because I like, I was literally in a war zone uh, most of the time fighting for my own personal security. Um, and so, but when I got, I could, I got a drink in me, I didn't have to worry about it. It's like, you know, the beatings hurt less and, uh, I didn't really have to care about anything. I, I, uh, <clears throat> I experienced this freedom uh, for the first time, uh, in, in my life. And, uh, and I won't, and I, you know, I'm pretty sure I puked and I'm pretty sure I couldn't wait to do it again. Um, and so, uh, that was 10. And so by the time I was 16, I, uh, I was like 50 pounds underweight. I just OD'd on some stuff and was drinking daily. I was ingesting whatever I could get my hands on, uh, as much as I could. I really had lived with a death, death wish for a long time. And so, um, I ended up in detox when I was 16, um, went to, I had a psychotic break. I ended up at a maximum security, uh, psych ward treatment center in Minnesota for you know, like a year. And, um, in that time I found out I was an alcoholic and I wasn't crazy, which was kind of a relief, but also a bummer, uh, <laughs> yes. because I was 16, I wasn't even old enough to drink and like, I can't drink anymore. What? <laughs> uh, so it was, it was, uh, it was confusing, but it was also, um, I, I cannot tell you the, the level of insanity that I, I lived at. I was, you know, for, for most of, um, my adolescence and even in my first time around in sobriety. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so I sobered up and I went like, you know, I went to meetings and stuff. I, I, I uh. I'm from upstate New York originally. When I got out of treatment, I ended up in Vegas. I got a job at a 24 hour AA club and uh, making coffee and stuff. And so I just tried, I tried on Alcoholics Anonymous. I am, uh, you know, I'm the salesman. I am the chameleon. I don't know exactly, I do now, but I didn't know who I was. I didn't know how to be in this world. I didn't know how to exist. Uh, I hated the world and I really wanted to watch it burn. Uh, most of the time. And so I always felt like an alien, like a stranger in a strange land, very suspicious, uh, very guarded, very much uh, terrified, uh, you know, and so uh, you'd be hard pressed to get uh, to know me in any other way than the way that I wanted you to know me. Um, and so that took a lot of energy and, you know, there's, there's a lot of very uh, inconvenient things in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous when you're trying to run a life and stay sober on self-will alone, uh, especially like the turning it over, like you just kind of have to ignore some of that stuff and make up your own way. And so that's what I did for 13 years. I stayed sober. I tried lots of different things. I tried to be a husband. I tried to be a father to a stepson. I tried to be uh, successful, which was, came pretty easy. Um, I tried everything. And so I, here I had climbed this mountain. I was, a, you know, not supposed to survive my childhood. I became successful. Uh, I had a house and like all that stuff. And I was like, this is it? You know, like, really? This is it? Um, and it was um, unfortunate. I was kind of bummed out. Like, nothing, and I was going to meetings. I mean, I had to, <clears throat> if you knew me, you would recognize that I had some life coach level sobriety. Um, <laughs> you know, I was totally, <clears throat> I was so, I was awesome all the time, really put together um, <clears throat> on the outside. I said all the right things. I did all the right things. <laughs> I drove the right thing, you know, and so, um, uh, that's how, that's how it went for me up until my, you know, 13th, 
uh, your sobriety. I uh, just like any any normal person, I waited until my girlfriend at the time went to sleep, and I snuck out of the house uh, to the gas station and got a little drinky poo, little malt beverage. It was. I only remember it. I don't know why, uh, but uh, it's a kiwi strawberry something. I was like, I was like, you know, you didn't want anybody to see you or whatever. So I just like grabbed something and got out of there. And so I, I took a sip and I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't burst into flames. Uh, so I had, and I drank one and I was like, all right, cool. Uh, well, maybe it was just because I was 16 and I was impetuous and like, you know, had poor impulse control like any teenager and, you know, really just did everything I could to talk myself into having another drink. Um, and so then I got a, I got a, a, a tall boy, a, a Guinness. And uh, I never had Guinness before. It's like, this is gross. I dumped it out. All right. So that's two. That's two. I'm doing pretty good uh, drinking. Uh, and without the consequences that I'm accustomed to. And then um, I was like, I decided to celebrate my um, drinking like a gentleman. And uh, I got, uh, just like any gentleman would, I got myself a very nice bottle of whiskey <coughs> and poured two fingers over ice in a glass. And I was sitting on, I remember I was sitting in my, um, in my back patio talking to my sales, I was a sales manager, I was talking to some of my reps and stuff and having a little drink poo and get loose and uh, I woke up like four hours later face down a puddle of vomit the house was dark and girlfriend was gone I had apparently uh, asked her to kill me in a blackout and um, I was like well shit don't turn it back now <laughs> uh, and proceeded to drink uh, you know uh, my face off all over the country. I had, I never, you know, I, never, I got sober on a 16. So I went and I drank at every bar I possibly could all over the country. I had, you know, drinks and coconuts and the go cups and a glass and all, you know, I ran out of the bottle, whatever. Um, so just get it out of my system. And um, within about a year and a half, I ended it. It's probably like, it's like two years. I was in a house by myself. Uh, I had moved away. Uh, moved south so because um, everybody that knew me in Orlando, I was living in Florida at the time. Everybody in my circle knew me as sober Bill, so it was like, well, I'm not that guy anymore. I'm drunk Bill. Uh, and uh, so I'm in South Florida, no friends, I just have a job and stuff. And I ended up like, I'm like, okay, I ended up um, you know, uh, firing up the car in the garage, and I had. And, you know, I've been halfway through a half gallon. I'm like, all right, you know, this is it. I don't want to do this anymore. And so I drank until I passed out in um, the garage of the car running. And I woke up. Uh, the car ran out of gas. And I, ha I had, you know, there's probably at least a quarter tank. So <laughs> uh, it's just one of those things. And I was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> I was really pissed. <laughs> Because I was out of booze and I was out of gas, and <laughs> <laughs> the store was not close by, right? So yeah, that, and that was like a real, uh, you know, that pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. When when I drink, I court death. I don't, you know, uh, I'm I'm I'm, re I'm like I'm ready, and so I was like, okay, well, back to the death wish days. Um, and I proceeded to try and drink myself to death for the next seven years all over the country until I was isolated and alone. And like, I ended up out here and I, you know, I was going to come out here and smoke pot and like drink craft beers and it was going to be all good. Uh, that was not my experience. Um, <laughs> so I went to New Orleans. Um, I was going to sober up there because if you can't do it in the most difficult circumstances, <laughs> then really what's the point? Why even buy it? Uh, and uh, yeah, and then that's really like the only time I can try to control drinking. Uh, you can drink walking down the street in, in New Orleans, like. So I started buying these pints. I was like, I'll just buy a pint. So, but I ended up like buying like six or seven pints throughout the course of the day, and I like have to slam them in between point A and point B. So I'd wake wake up. And I lived in the ninth ward. I really didn't belong where I lived. 
um, I would wake up under like a bridge and be like, it was like, it was just, you know, insanity. Um, and so, uh, I got out of New Orleans. I went to Slidell, which is on the other side of Lake Ponce train and, um, got enough money to get back here because I had some work lined up and I was going to, I was going to come back here, go to a vow never to drink again. I'm on the train. Trains are great for drunks because you can put a half gallon of booze in your backpack and people leave you alone for the most part. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I got, I got back here and within an hour I was slamming PBRs at the dock with my buddy and, um, you know, got to that same point again. And I was living on a, I was living on a, um, it was in North Everett, North dock, living on a sailboat and, uh, was just trying to buy my time and, uh, um, you know, and just dr drinking and I get to, you know, the booze really, ultimately the booze stopped working for me. And it was a, um, <laughs> there was a whole lot of heartbreak around that because it's literally, but it is like a full-time job to try to drink yourself to death. It takes so much energy and so much effort uh, to, <laughs> to try and do that. It's just incredible the amount of energy they put into that, that I can see now, like looking back. Um, and so I was like, uh, well, I, uh, I couldn't drink enough to black out or pass out or make the voices in my head stop and stop the turmoil and all the, all that garbage. And, um, so I decided I was going to hang myself and I don't know if you've ever been in a sailboat before, but there's about five foot nine headspace. I'm six feet tall. <laughs> so here I am. Uh, like trying to figure this out and I ultimately, I, you know, I spent some time hanging around <laughs> uh, quite literally and, uh, and I woke up and uh, I woke, I woke up and um, it was really uh, an act of providence. I prayed. I'm not, you know, I've never been very big on religion or God. Um, but I, I had no other options, right? So I, I prayed and then I called the central office in Everett and I talked to Carrie and I, this, I used to uh, stumble past this building that gave me some very weird vibes. Turns out it was a fellowship hall. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no wonder I cross the street. I remember it. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know that place. And there is no, like, you know, there isn't a circle and triangle out front, but you know, um, you get good radar when you're stumbling through life drunk. <laughs> you just are like, no, not that way. Uh, and so uh, I went there. Um, it's a Saturday, the eleven o'clock meeting, which was my home group for uh, the past uh, several years. And uh, I was I was struck sober. I had no intention, no plan of sobering up. No. None of that. Going back to AA, please forget, forget it. Too many rules, too much stuff, too many, yeah, all that stuff. There's no way I'm doing it. Um, uh, but that's what I was doing. So I was literally watching this happen to me. And I, I um, it's super surreal. I didn't, I sobered up in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have been drinking a half a gallon of, of vodka and a six pack a day for forever. And, um, uh, I was struck sober. I didn't stop. I didn't quit. I didn't make a decision. Um, I did not have a whole lot to do with it other than just going. Right. And so, uh, uh, yeah, struck sober June 15th, 2013, Everett, Washington. Wow. Um, and I, the, uh, you know, these people were, they were very nice to me. I was very, I had long hair. I had a like, goatee. I was very scary. I tried to be as scary as, as I could be because I was terrified. Um, and so they would, you know, as they would always, you know, like, they would wait. If it was just me, I would wait to unlock the building because I was this crazy, creepy, long hair, <laughs> drunk, weirdo. Um, yeah, and so these people they took they tried to take and get me get some food in me and I couldn't I couldn't eat. It was just like keep coming back. And I'm like, okay. 
And so that's what I did. And I, um, so for the next 10 days, I was awake. I couldn't sleep. Like you, you vibrate pretty hard when you just go off booze without any assistance. Like, and somebody, uh, somebody, uh, uh, questioned my willingness cause I wasn't in a detox. And I was like, I'll go to detox. And I walked out of the hospital and it was a rock hospital cause it's like the pay hospital. You know, you got to go to the other hospital. I'm like, well, that's all the other way. And it's, I got to pass a fellowship hall uh, to get to the other hospital. So I just, you know, I went to a meeting instead. Um, I just, I was going to seven, eight meetings a day. Um, I couldn't stand to be around. I couldn't stand to be, you know, with myself. I couldn't stand to be in my own skin, in my own head. Um, the, I was, my anxiety was turned up to like 17. I had this, um, this de depressant that was like, you know, um, in every single fiber of my being, you know, uh, seeping out from me now, right? Uh, exercising the demons, as it were. Um, and so I was just nuts. I just, I walked all day and I went to meetings all day. And um, I, all night I would listen to speaker tapes and I'd blow up the, the, the A hotline. Uh, and until like, and I just keep calling people back until, until I got their voicemail. Um, <laughs> and I have, I still have the, the numbers on the backs of the schedules. I called all those people. Like, oh, I was so desperate. Um, thank God. I was so desperate and so willing, uh, to do whatever, um, needed to be, to be done. Um, and I was like watching this happen to me. I was, you know, a participant, but, you know, I was a mess. Um, and so I just went to meetings all the time and uh, tried not to think. And, uh, I, you know, I had DTs down at the, at the uh, boat launch with the seagulls cursing at me and like, you know, <laughs> uh, j just, just, just craziness. Um, but, you know, it was like they were laughing at me. I knew they were laughing at me. You know, the sea lions and the seagulls are just laughing at me. Uh, I'd be just so pissed. And I'm like, oh, I can't be, I get, you know, anger is like, you know, resentment's the number one offender. I got to listen to the speaker tape. Uh, it was just like, it was super intense like that for, for a while. And so I got a sponsor for this guy talking about pitiful and uh, um, incomprehensible demoralization. And I was like, I mean, and I looked at him, he was looking at me. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Uh, and so I was like, that guy's going to be my sponsor. And um, yeah, I was like, well, when can we work some steps? He's like, dude, you are crazy right now. Look, just, just uh, look, find some guy that's worse off than you and help him out. And I was like, this hope ignited inside me that someone thought that there was someone out there <laughs> that had it worse off than me in that moment. I was like, you really think somebody has it worse than me? He's, oh yeah. He's like, go find him. Uh, and I was like, that's amazing. It was super, it was the most exciting thing I'd heard in 10 years. Uh, I mean that, like seriously. Uh, and I just like, all right, I'm going, I'm gonna go find this guy. And I found him, Daryl. He, he stumbled into a meeting, reeking of whiskey. Uh, and I was like, God, that smells like whiskey. What's he doing at AA meeting? It's like, bing, like, that's my guy, right? Uh, and he was a, that guy was a freaking mess. Um, and he was worse off than me in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, you know, I just, that's how it went for me early on. Like, meetings all day, every day, and new guys, and I ended up, uh, I lost my place to live. Everybody thought I was homeless. And I was just making it up that I lived out at the marina. But I was actually staying on a sailboat. Chat, which was really, once you sober up, I was surrounded by all this wonderful majesty. Like the sunrises and the sunset and the tranquility of the oceans lapping on the, on the sailboats. And like it was magical down there. Uh, amazing what a couple of days of being sober would do to a guy. Uh, and uh, so this guy's like, you know, hey, um, he's like, I'll give you a job. Come, 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 just hang out with me. I'll give you, a, give you. A, like, I'm not really in, you know, not really in shape to be working. Uh, but he just is like, he took, you know, he did what we do. Uh, I mean, 
And so I'm at this guy's house and all of a sudden some other guy shows up. He got a no contact and couldn't go home. Uh, so he's on his couch and this other guy got out of treatment, Ricky. And the next thing you know, this guy's house is full and he's like, I'm going to open up a sober house up the street and I want you to run it. And I was like, what are you talking about, man? I'm like, I got two months sober. I, I don't know anything about that. And um, he's like, you're the guy. You're the guy. <clears throat> I'm the guy. Okay. And so I did that for like three years. We opened the sober house and I got to help guys get to the fellowship that they belonged in and learn about, you know, singleness of purpose and the differences between the different fellowships. And I learned so much. I learned so much. I watched some, I had to watch, you know, some people die. It's a fatal disease if left uh, untreated. People are, you know, dying all the time. I've lost lots of people since I got sober uh, to alcoholism. Um, uh, but I've seen so lots of guys like, you know, have my experience uh, and recover. Uh, from a hopeless and helpless state of mind. And like, I, I, you know, I just had to stay busy. And that's, you know, uh, Austria is very, very, uh, uh, it's an accurate assessment of, of me saying yes, but it's not altruistic, right? I, I've had, so I've had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. So I have a duty and responsibility to carry the message about Carl's Thomas, right? Step 12 is denial of self. Right. I, if I want to be free, then I need to, I need to, I need to be of service. I need to serve others. And so it's not because, well, and here's the other, the ego part of me is like, I love being admired from a distance. Like maybe I'm, maybe there's a sun setting behind me. I'm on a horse. Maybe I'm <laughs> like, people are like, look at that guy. Look at that Bill W. Isn't he just fantastic? Um, I love that shit. Um, but it is dangerous. <laughs> it is deadly, like to to me. So uh, there's a part of me that wants to be, you know, accepted and like fit in and like um, all that stuff. Um, uh, but that's not my my intent. My intent is not a superficial desire to satisfy my ego so I can feel good about myself because that is a fleeting uh, experience and a total waste of time that um, leads to just other negative behaviors. Uh, and so what I learned was that, you know, if I want to be free from the bondage of self, if I want a vacation from Bill, I got to think about you and not me. And if I can't, if I'm thinking about you, I can't think about me. If I'm not thinking about me, then I'm free. Um, and I like that because I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm a huge pain in the ass. All right. Um, and I have to pr probably less outwardly as I am internally, but I am a difficult person. I think all the time. I'm like, my brain is always going a thousand miles an hour. I, I never had any way to deal with that in a positive, con constructive, healthy, uh, healthy manner. So serve others, right? Like it, it says, be of maximum health, helpfulness to others. Who? Everybody. Everybody. Even that guy. You know, in, in the passing lane in front of me <laughs> that is going one or two miles below the speed limit, right? Uh, everybody, everybody. We have maximum helpfulness to everybody all the time. I never, <laughs> not that that idea is great, but it's not impossible because I'm a flawed human being, right? I get angry. I get resentful. I make mistakes. Uh, I cause harm. I have a remedy for that today, right? I can go and I can rectify those situations. Um, I, um, and, 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 you know, you know, this design for living that I talk, that, that we talk about working, working the program, the 12 steps of alcoholics anonymous. Now, my first time around, I worked my own program. I got nothing. I was, I was just an angry douche, uh, but I was sober. So it wasn't as bad as being drunk. Right. Uh, this time, I completely abandoned myself to sobriety. It was all by accident. I didn't like. I wasn't trying. I wasn't. I accidentally tried hard, and like, I did what it said to do, and the, these results started occurring. I remember walking home. It was 40, 41, 41, 50. I just turned fifty in September. Uh, Forty-one years old, new, newly sober, walking. Uh, back to the marina and 
I became very suspicious and looking around and listening. And for the first time in my life, it was quiet. Like not birds and traffic and stuff, but in between my ears, it was quiet. It was weird. It was bizarre. It's like, whoa, what is going on here? Uh, oh God, God, it worked, right? Getting rid of all this wreckage and all this, all this baggage, all this, this turmoil. I, I, my first time around, I took all of my, my childhood trauma and all that stuff that never got resolved. Um, you know, that, that's who I was. I was like a victim and a survivor. And like I used a therapy uh, to help me because it was all about me. Who else would it be about? If it wasn't about me, someone else, you know, that doesn't make sense. Um, and so you're like, what's, what's that going to do for me? <laughs> what are you going to do for, for, for me? Right. And so I, I never had the, my perception was never uh, altered in that, in that aspect. Um, and, and I was incapable. And that's fine. It says in the book that sometimes, uh, and I've, I've suggested it to many people, maybe you should just have a little drinking food. Maybe you can have one or two or three. Try some of that controlled drinking and see where it gets you. And if it doesn't work, you know, hey, man, you know, I did it. I made it back. Uh, I know people who haven't, so, you know, know that. But uh, <coughs> that's... That's the best thing that happened to me, really. Uh, uh, tons of horrible things happened. I hurt a lot of people as a result of that. But uh, the person that's sitting in front of you t t today, like, I wouldn't be, uh, I'd be incapable of having the perception uh, and the uh, a servant's existence uh, that I try to live each day. If I didn't go out and get drunk, because, you know, uh, I just really needed to. Unfortunately, and, you know, and that and that's okay. I'm glad I, I made it back. Lots of people don't get that, that chance. So, so now I'm sober, and I'm you know get my life together, and I got involved in service. And <clears throat> it's got Andy J. He moved he moved away. He lives in Denver now, but he he um, I uh, I was the PI chair um, for my for my district, and I didn't even have a driver's license, but so I just manipulate people to help me take the literature where I need to go. And I would say, you want to be the sur you want to be a service? I find somebody in the car. You want to be a service to Alcoholics Anonymous? <laughs> and ask them around a few people, so you know, that, so you can, you know, the the answer is predestined to be yes. Uh, great, let's go cool do this, right? And so he he said to me um, quarterly, he said nothing will expose your character defects like service and Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, he is one hundred. I used to go. I went to the quarterlies for a lot of years without any, I didn't have anywhere else to go. And I didn't have, I couldn't spend my money on what I used to spend my money on. And I wanted to be connected. I want to be a part of, I, I you know, lived a life of isolation. And uh, so I just go and, and sit and I get so mad. So why are you, why do you people just talk so much about the same thing? Why can't somebody just make a decision? <laughs> All right. and so, uh, you know, and that is a reflection on me, not the discussion, because the discussion is the process. Right? It's not the decision, it's the discussion. Uh, and it took me a long time to f figure that out. Um, and it took me even longer to be a part of it. Uh, and and to find value in that, and then, and so what I, and what I accidentally, I accidentally became patient, a little. Um, I accidentally became understanding. I accidentally uh, listened instead of waited, waiting instead of waiting to talk, instead of correct you from your opinion. Uh, everybody's entitled to their opinion, even if they are wrong, right? Um, <laughs> I, I learned to not live in absolutes. I was a, you know, I was always right. You know, I'm a smart guy. It's not, it's not a good thing. Uh, it's a hassle. Um, and uh, so I, I don't, you know, I've learned to not even really care that much about my own opinion. Like, 
who cares about what I think? My opinion is my perception of, of the sequence of events that have transpired in my life, that I've formulated them intellectually and emotionally, and, and, and that's how I see things because of my own personal experiences. So it's pretty individual to me. It's not, uh, my opinion is not truth. It is not, a, you know, it's not this solidified, um, you know, uh, a thing that is absolute and that is always, always <laughs> It's right. It's like who cares? I don't. I don't need to be right. So, you, would you rather be happy than be right? Yes. Yeah, I would. Um, and I didn't. You know, I, but I didn't know any other way. Like it's a lot. You know, it feels pretty good to be right. Uh, not gonna lie. Um, and although I'm right a lot of the time, my intent is right. I'm not trying to be right. It just uh, you know, it, it just it doesn't. There's so much in this world that that just it, do, it doesn't it doesn't matter and i'm and i'm just like i'm free 100 percent free i don't i'm not afraid of anything you know uh god has done for me what i could not do for myself i'm just trying to do the next right thing right i'm i'm not in charge i'm not the boss uh, i'm just a servant looking for some service Really, it's like, and I, you know, when I do that in all aspects of my my life, the, it's kind of it's another accidental thing. Okay, it might be God <laughs> directing me. Maybe it's not an accident. Whatever. Uh, um, but uh, I just lived into this way. I kept doing these things that it says in this book to do. That you know, <laughs> you hear over and over in these people harping on uh, doing this stuff. Um, and so I had the 12 steps, you know, for, for my own recovery and the 12 traditions so I can navigate the world around me. I have the concepts that I can utilize in my business dealings. Um, and uh, I don't have to make anything up. I don't have to c complicate it. Um, my first sponsor, uh, the most valuable piece of information that probably anyone has ever given me was that uh, he told me, uh, we're talking about guys like that, two things you need to know about God. One, there is one, and two, you're not it, right? That is the basis of my spiritual foundation. I don't even know anything else. Uh, you know, uh, God has showed up in my, I sobered up at 41 years old and, and can continue to, uh, have this deep, uh, meaningful, connected, loving, nurturing existence. It's people, you know, this is this is not a life beyond. This would probably this would be like a life of my absolute nightmares. Drinking, right? People say this is like a life beyond your wildest dreams. I would not dream the <laughs> life that I have, like being uh, loving and like selfless and. A, servant to others and like that is not i would not dream that for for myself um and again i'm not you know i don't these are the things that i strive for you know um i don't do them perfectly that that's for sure um and you know all of this uh i don't you know i don't get any credit credit for it uh i just showed up and did what i was told and like it works. I am the result of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous at work. And the main purpose of all this is find God, know God, get right with God, serve God, 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 God. Um, you know, not, not me. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, every day. I, I pull into my house. I have a beautiful, I love my wife uh, more than anything I've ever loved um, that I've been capable of, right? I was not capable of love. Hate, resentment, uh, I, can, I could do. Uh, love, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous opened my heart to a, a love uh, that is beyond measure. Right? It all started with, you know, going to a meeting and like, not being afraid and getting getting God and getting God in my life. It's all about, you know, God and and whatever that 
power greater than myself is, uh, continues to work in my life on a daily basis because left to my own devices, you know, I've, 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 I've uh, yeah, I have a pretty good, good track record uh, when it comes to me and my own, own devices. But being a servant, uh, a humble servant, uh, as the best of my ability to the God of my understanding, and like that is my perception, that is my focus, like every day, it's, it's, yeah. To say it's incredible is be an understanding. But I mean, like I get to, I get to live this. And I, that, that's why, you know, that's, I, you know, being, serving others, serving Alcoholics Anonymous, serving the world that I, that I live in is, um, you know, so important to, to me. Um, so I think that's, oh yeah, good. That's it. Yeah. Thank you.